I'm here at USAR 2014 at UCLA with Joe Chang. Hi, Joe. Hi. So you are one of the superstar developers that oh. was brought in to basically build out what is now the dominant IDE. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you found yourself? Because I looked at your LinkedIn, and uh, you were, I believe, at Microsoft for a mm -hmm. while. You are a really a world-class computer scientist. Oh. How did you find yourself here? Uh, you know, it, it goes back to college, actually. Uh, my first job in programming um, was uh, at one of J.J. Allaire's companies uh, that um, was where I cut my teeth, where I learned web programming and really fell in love with with programming computers and um, over the years I've kind of traveled in and out of uh, JJ's orbit and network <laughs> and uh, and the the last company that I had worked for um, had been acquired by Microsoft and after some time at Microsoft and I really felt ready to leave it timing kind of worked out that JJ was investigating this R thing and it was really pretty early back then and I mean, most people had no idea what R was. It wasn't showing up Absolutely. on Hacker News or anything yet. Yeah. Um, and he, when he approached me to say, you know what, I've, I've found this technology. I think it really could use some attention from guys like us. What do you, what do you think? And I had no particular interest in stats at the time, but uh, our studio really started with the idea of building an IDE on the web for R. And mm -hmm. it was the on the web part that really got my attention. And I said, you know, stats, I don't really know anything about, but building an IDE on the web. Yeah, that's that sounds interesting, and I'll, and I'll get behind that. That's exciting on its own, right? Uh, you know, I, I had the fortune of speaking with JJ earlier, and really, that was a gamble. It absolutely was, and, and I, re I still remember the first time he showed me the, the first prototype that he had. Uh, he he uh, flew out to uh, the Seattle area to see me, and, and we were in his in a hotel room, hovered over a laptop, and he was like, this is what I think, and I, was, I took a look, and I was like, this feels like it has maybe a 50% chance of working out. <laughs> Maybe 50, um, but uh, you know, over the years, JJ and I have marveled that bet after technical bet has worked out in our favor, and that's really surprising. That just it's not something that usually happens. Yeah, even in the times that JJ and I have worked together in the past, we've had bets that, you know, oh well, if we could go back, we'd we'd do that over. But this big bet of can we build an IDE using exclusively web technologies has actually worked out really well. Well, so one of the things that I love about our studio which is probably on purpose, is that I have the version installed on my Mac, and I can do all of the work that I need to on there, but at any moment, I can flip to the RStudio server that I have on my big server at work, and it's the exact same development environment. That's right. Is that, so I take it that that is the goal and the future direction, to keep that seamless transition. Yeah, uh, you know, it's funny, I don't know if JJ mentioned this, but when we started our studio, or when he started our studio, the idea was really that it was a web-only IDE, that the only way you would use RStudio was through the server. And it really was right up until, I don't remember exactly what year it was, maybe the summer of 2010. And we thought we were about ready to launch. And then JJ luckily kind of got cold feet and was like, wait a minute, is everyone really going to run this on a Linux server? Is that really a realistic proposition, or are people just going to want to download this and install it on their desktop? So we, he kind of put the brakes on the release and was like, let's just do one more thing. Let's make a little desktop wrapper, and then we'll call it our studio desktop. And of course, now that's how 95 plus percent of users use our studio. Uh, so, you know, it's actually relatively inexpensive for us to keep these, you know, multiple um, versions going. When we develop a feature, we generally just develop it once. So, uh, so it really does, it does work uh, well for us to keep up this model. Uh, so do you actually do a lot of development in R at this point? Uh, I spend uh, most of my days writing R. Uh, ever since uh, the summer of 2012, I moved over to working on Shiny. And, okay. um, and that is you know, primarily R, uh, well, R and JavaScript, maybe half and half. So you know, uh, I came from a traditional software development background. My background okay. is computer science. And when I was first exposed to the R language, I was a little horrified. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I, mean, if you come I was from, as well, yeah. Yeah, if you come from traditional, you, there are things you expect. That's right. And the R programming language, you know, uh, we saw in John Chambers' uh, 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 talk yesterday, that's really not the idea. The idea is that it's an interface, it's an interactive environment. Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to transition your mental model from 
traditional software development languages to R? It, it took a really long time. It really did. Uh, I don't know how many times JJ had to tell me, no, they're all vectors. They're all <laughs> vectors. And I was like, but what about when it's just a scalar? No, right. That literally doesn't exist. Yeah, I didn't and, use the letter C. Yeah. It's clearly not a vector. Yeah. You know, I, you know, at the time, especially trying to learn the language from scratch, all of the training materials or books and you know tutorials were all written from the pr perspective of statisticians that yeah. didn't have a background in programming at all. So uh, no one was taking particularly great pains to say this is the difference between what you might expect from one language and, and this uh, until I found O'Reilly's R in a Nutshell. Uh, and this is several years ago, so I'm sure there have been other okay. great books written since then. Uh, but that really helped me uh, because it, it had, I, a, as I recall, it, it talked more about here's the language. It didn't say, Let's start out with example one, linear regression. And right. I'm like, that's, you know, that's not where I'm going. Um, and really, it wasn't until I started writing R code for real. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I spent a couple of years just writing a, a UI that was not written in R. It was just written for R. But it was really when I started developing packages uh, and then really when I started uh, doing data analysis on our own our log files and things like that, mm -hmm. when I really started to feel, oh, okay, not only do I really understand now how, how R works in these ways, but I understand why, that it actually really makes sense. The why is hard, right? Because we're, we're accustomed to a, you know, a code compile, basically, or, or run in an interpreter and just look at the output. We're not accustomed that's to this right. REPL interface. That's and right. That's something that I think really strikes people is the fact that there is part of R that is explicitly designed to be used interactively. Yes, yes. And you know, I had spent a lot of time with Ruby, so okay. the, the interactive part was not the part that kind of threw me. It was, well, I, I don't know how technical you want to no, get as in technical this, but as you want. It, it's, I think the thing that people who really look at the language and have a background in software find absolutely shocking is the combination of, uh, it's not a pure functional language, right? It, it's an imperative uh, yep. language with, with functional attributes, which is, that in and of itself is totally fine. Yep. But you combine that with function arguments that by default have delayed evaluation. That still blows my mind. Yes, it, it's amazing that it works at all, right? <laughs> No, it really is. I mean, from, yeah. from, a, from a soundness, from a theory standpoint, that just seems like y you would never put those two things together. And, um, and e even last week, I was at a, another conference with a, a lot of computer scientists who have spent a lot of time with R, and they all feel like th this is, it's amazing that, that this model works. But after using R, using R in anger, as they say, mm -hmm. I, I really have come to understand why those features are important. And um, this really, I think, is one of the core things that I've learned over the past year, that I think that the R community at large, and especially the people who get into flame wars about R versus Python versus Julia, have not yet come to appreciate about R, which is a lot of people from other camps like to refer to R sort of pejoratively mm -hmm. as a DSL. It's not a full language, it's yeah. just a DSL. And I think that couldn't be further from the truth. I think what R is, is a general purpose language in which you can create DSLs okay, for that's, statistics. That's really interesting. And if you look at, if you really look at the work that uh, has been done in you know, any of the base graphics libraries, if you look at uh, ggplot, uh, or ggplot2, shiny, ggviz, dplyr, each one of these libraries has a bunch of features and a bunch of syntax that would not be possible, certainly with Python, certainly with Java, certainly with C++. Uh, I'm not sure about Julia. I haven't spent uh, much time with it. Uh, any language short of uh, you know, a, a Lisp true macros yeah. style environment. And I think when you look at the, 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 the interfaces of these packages, users don't necessarily know what magic we had to do to make this happen. They yeah. just know, oh, it's really easy. It's really concise when I, when I express my plots this way, when I express my data manipulations this way. Yeah, I think it's called, uh, in Hadley's book, uh, The Advanced Star Programming, I think he calls it a non-standard evaluation. Sure. That's what it's called. Yeah. You know, that was, that's something that I still wrestle with, is the understanding that our built-in has this entire symbolic layer. That That's right. Your code that you're typing in the middle of a function call is itself a symbol that the function will then treat. That's right. And that. That's something that we're not, we're just not, I genuinely don't know I, exactly outside of like research of Lisp type languages, any other environment, and certainly not another one that has the vibrant community that R yes. has. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, a lot of other languages stay away from that kind of stuff because if abused, it can be really harmful. Uh, and I, I think when you put a, a tool like that in Hadley's hands, then really beautiful results come out. Um, but the, the, 
the kind of closest you would get in sort of a very mainstream programming language would be like C preprocessor macros, sure. right? And history is littered with yeah. like, oh my gosh, yeah. every every C programmer thinks those are a really good idea for their first project, their and first then yeah. <laughs> and then they learn. Um, so obviously, it's a tool that. Uh, I think it's it's really nice in R because in order to make use of those uh, features, it does there is a little bit of a learning curve. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly natural the way C macros are that, oh, this is how I would use and abuse this feature. This requires a little bit of study, so people who are more advanced tend to be the ones that step into this after they've already gotten a flavor of what they can do without it. It's unlikely you're going to stumble into it. Exactly, exactly. Whereas, yes. whereas there's a lot of other languages where the, where the sharp, sticky bits, you may very well stumble That's into. right. Changing topic slightly, so uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, data science as communication. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge fan of the reproducible research movement. Uh, I'm a big fan of Knitter, but I really like what you guys are doing with Shiny. I think Shiny Thanks. is really one of those next stages of evolution in how you take complexity and make it accessible to folks. Yep. Can you talk to me a little bit about sort of the cognitive model of Shiny and your approaches and the philosophy and what excites you about the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Shiny really started from a conversation we had, uh, or I'd say the, 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 the seed was planted, way back in the early days of our studio. Uh, we were meeting with um, uh, Professor Danny Kaplan uh, at um, McAllister College, and he heard that we were doing something regarding R on the web. And what we really meant was an R IDE on the web. But he heard R on the web and he was like, oh, great. So you mean these Java applets that I've been building to demonstrate statistical ideas. Oh, you mean I can do this with R? Awesome. And we had to be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. We're not building a web framework or anything like that. Um, and he just really implored us. He said, I really think something like this would really, really be useful. And um, what I said then, and I said for the next couple of years, is I agree that that is a really great idea. We shouldn't do it unless we feel like we have a really nice solution for it. That's a problem that's really easy to solve poorly. Poorly, absolutely. Um, and, and what we don't need is for our developers to spend all their time becoming web developers. That's not what we want, right? Um, so it really wasn't until um, this idea of reactive programming sure. um, was something that I was exposed to through the JavaScript framework Meteor. and. Um, Really? So you got you got inspired from the Meteor framework? Yes. I'm a huge fan of the Meteor framework, so yes. it's interesting to hear that that was your inspiration. Yeah, I, uh, I was, um, I, I saw the screencast yeah. when they first came out, and... It was I, breathtaking. I, yeah, I don't remember another project like this, maybe some Brett Victor stuff, you know, but the reaction on online on, on uh, you know, Dig and Hacker News and all the usual places, people were like, no way, that's not something's not right here, like yeah. that's fake. You know, you're gonna peek behind the curtain and you're gonna find out that it's all fake. And uh, you know, the people who had taken some time to kick the tires were like, no guys, this is, I mean, there's some limitations, there's some trade-offs, sure. but the magic is real and it's, it's good magic, you know. Um, so I heard uh, one of these, uh, I think maybe the author of Ember has a quote, it's good magic because it de decomposes to sane primitives. And, uh, and that's what wow. people were saying about Meteor, that the result is magic, but it's not the kind of bad magic that when it breaks, you don't understand what happens. So I saw this about Meteor, and just for weeks, this was spinning in my head, like, how do they do that? I don't, I just don't. So finally, I was coming back from a trip, and I just downloaded the Meteor uh, Git repo, and uh, you know, I was just sitting, sitting on my, in, in my airplane seat, trying to dig through the code and figure out where did this magic come from? How did they do all this stuff where you don't have to go and update little chunks of your document. Everything just automatically updates itself. And I found my way to a single JavaScript uh, source file that I swear was 50 lines of co code. Wow. had no dependencies. It was just called devs.js. And it said, this is reactivity. And it was this, I mean, this beautiful thing, this two little tricks that enable all this magic to, to fall out of it. So that idea was kind of planted in my head and kicking around for a few weeks. And I think maybe three or four weeks later, it was actually at USAR uh, two years ago. The last day of USAR, I woke up and the first thought in my head, literally the first thought, I was asleep and then the first thought I thought was, if we combine that on the server side and write a reactive framework in R, then all we need on the client side is regular HTML with some annotations to indicate these are inputs and these are outputs. Yeah. And everything else could take care of itself. Um, and you know, a couple tweaks here and there later, and that was the 
gotcha. the idea has largely um, been intact uh, all the way through. And through it all, our most important um, goal for Shiny has been for the average R user, the typical R user, even the beginning R user, to be able to build Shiny applications. So uh, there are a lot of things that we could do if we said the barrier for entry is just a little bit higher. We're going to force you to learn one of these new things. Um, but we've re we really wanted to keep it to, as an accessible tool that everybody can take advantage of. Um, and that's, that's going to continue to be our, our, our focus going forward. That's fantastic. You know, so, uh I, I, I was speaking with Yuhui earlier, and he said that he thinks that the right way to learn R programming now is actually, if you're a brand new programmer, is to focus on the graphics. And to take that even further, uh, you know, I have a 13-year-old son, and listening to you talk makes me think that maybe the right way to really introduce him to R is actually just skip almost all of R and just introduce him to Shiny as a pedagogic platform. As, to your knowledge, is anybody doing anything like that? Um, I don't know. I think um, it's still it's still early days for us. I think people are uh, well. Maybe things have really changed lately. A, a year ago at Usar, we were still telling people what Shiny was, uh, okay. and <laughs> this year, you know, I started my talk with a bunch of slides about here's what Shiny is, and I felt a little bit silly because I mean, so many of the other uh, presenters had, had already talked about it. Um, but that that's that's a really interesting idea. Um, you know, maybe I, I do. That idea that you should start with graphics really does resonate with me, though. The way I started in programming, uh, well, I tried twice. The oh, first really? time I was introduced um, through the sort of computer science route, I was in seventh grade, mm -hmm. and I went to um, a, a, a camp, you know, for computer camp. gifted kids or whatever. And, uh, and I was like, I love computers. I'm going to take computer science. And we spent the first week and a half learning theorem proving. 12-year-olds we're talking about. They're improving. Uh, DFAs and NFAs. Uh, what? Countable and uncountable ideas of infinite, right? Why would you do that to a 12-year-old? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and, and then when we finally uh, you know, got time to, to, to get on the machines, uh, the language that they taught us was scheme, which now I appreciate as being you know, beautiful and elegant. But I think it takes a certain, it takes a certain maturity to be able to you know, grasp why, why those. I, I just wanted to make the computer do something. Right. You know, I wanted to make it sing and dance. And it wasn't, a, I, that I kind of swore off programming. I still love computers, but programming, I was like, that's for that's people for, that are. That's for other folks. That's not what I thought it you know, was going to be. Uh, and it wasn't until um, I really got into making web pages on sort of the design side of things. I enjoyed making web pages that looked cool and I could tell yeah. a story and whatever. And, it, and then uh, you know, somebody asked me, well, wouldn't it be cool if you could make it do this? You could hit a submit button and something would come back. So I kind of like, oh, let me just learn enough programming to do that. That's actually how I got involved with, uh, with JJ's company was because uh, yeah. Cold Fusion was the, the dominant technology for doing that uh, for some period during the 90s. So that, that's how I learned. Um, but my, my point being, starting from something that excites you, that that is tangible, that you can get your hands around, um, I think is, if you can keep that, that passion, that excitement going, well, then, then learning is going to come naturally. It's like falling downhill, right? Yep. But if you have to start from first principles and really not have any motivating things that, that are keeping you going, then it's, it's really hard. Uh, one of the things that, when I started programming, when you booted up the computer, you were just presented with a programming interface, right? It yeah. was literally just it's like, all right, go. And the entire world was a very limited world. And you had some primitives that made it easy to draw things and yeah. make it beep. But like you're saying, basically sing and dance. When you try to introduce somebody now to programming or data analysis or anything, they're using this incredibly complicated edifice of layers of layers. And it's very hard for them to understand how their first few lines of code are going to ever translate into something complex and beautiful. Yeah. And I think what you guys are doing is you're sort of allowing a leapfrog to go back to that time where you could sit somebody in front of a computer and you could tell them, look, this is your computer for mm -hmm. today. And with these small things, you can make these large impacts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's, let's change topics for a second. Okay. Um, so as a programmer, you have a workflow. Yep. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about what your workflow is as an R programmer? Sure. Um, so I, I obviously use R Studio, um, and uh, and these days I mostly find myself working on um, you know a couple packages that we maintain. Uh, so I so I do a lot with with Shiny. Uh, so I generally um, I use uh, DevTools quite a lot. We use uh, Roxygen for our documentation, and we use uh, Test That for our for our tests. Um, and as of you know pretty recent versions of our studio, um, 
all of that can be driven through DevTools, through the RStudio interface. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I do my coding, things like that, write unit tests, and then I can just hit a keyboard shortcut to run tests right within our studio. I can, I can hit another button to build and reload the, the session. Um, so I, I generally do that when I'm working in, in R. Uh, I also uh, tend to write a lot of JavaScript, mm -hmm. and, um, and I often will jump out to Sublime Text or something else uh, for, for, for that kind of stuff. I think there's an interesting parallel between JavaScript and R. I think that there's cultural parallels, there's niche parallels. You know, uh, JavaScript went through this period where it was basically derided as a toy. Yep. And then, you know, the famous Crockford book, and then all of a sudden people began to really take it seriously. Yeah. Now, I'm relatively new to the R community, but I know that, like you're saying, not very long ago, R was very much just a tool that statisticians and academics use. Yeah. And now it's going through this boom. Do you see really, I mean, other than the work you're doing with Shiny, which is obvious, do you see other synergies between uh, R and JavaScript? Yeah, I think, well, the JavaScript pool has gotten so large that it, it's hard to generalize. But I do think that it's really interesting that you have this set of people like uh, um, Mike Bostock and Jeff Hare that are doing really, uh, well, I mean, Tons of people that are really, really interested in, in visualization uh, in, in the JavaScript it's world. Again with graphics. Yeah, and, and not only that, I don't think people necessarily uh, realize that they, if they haven't done a lot of visualization and graphics, at least in, in my opinion, we're not using the browser as a target for visualization because we have to. It's not because you want the distribution, therefore you have to put up with JavaScript and, and the DOM and SVG. It's because it actually is a great environment for doing graphics, yeah. and I think unless you've done a lot of GDI plus or you know Excellent. you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know unless you've you've tried to do similar things in kind of what we used to use ten years ago, um, it might be hard to appreciate just how high level and performant and standardized and tooled up um, all all of these technologies are, um, and, and so I think it's so cool that. You know, on this one hand, you've got these JavaScript people that are making these amazing visualizations, and then on this side, you've got these R people who have all this, you know, statistical horsepower and, and uh, all this great stuff with computation and doing this uh, stuff in a vectorized way. Um, it, it's, you know, Shiny started as a, as part part of what we wanted to do was create a bridge between these two communities. But you can see from the talks at this conference that the wall between these worlds is. Being being chipped away at from many different people, so you've got Ramnath with R charts, who yeah. is trying to kind of single-handedly drag every JavaScript library <laughs> into R, and he's doing a, a great job of it. And you've got you know other people that are, that are coming up with other ways. Uh, we so we wrote Shiny, and underneath Shiny is uh, another uh, library that we wrote called HDP UV, okay. and it is. Um, a, a web server, non-blocking web server, that's okay. uh, written around uh, a C library called libuv, which okay, yeah. uh, underlies Node.js. Uh, and we wrote that just because it was needed for Shiny, not for anything else. But it turns out there are enough other people that are trying to bridge Shiny and R. Uh, sorry, bridge JavaScript and R in a way that might be different from the Shiny paradigm, that there are a bunch of projects using HTTP UV itself and building their own Shiny-like constructs on top, which I, I thought was really interesting. And it just shows how much desire there is from our world to take advantage of, of what's in JavaScript. So, Which is interesting, because the R world is so academic, and the JavaScript world is historically not. Yeah. Um, uh, just two, a few more questions. Uh, is there a feature in R that so we talked about basically some of your favorite features. Is there a feature in R that you could really live without? Is there something about R that you don't like? Yeah, yeah. You know, and my my use of R is primarily as a package developer, so I think I have a, a, a kind of different slant on things. The one thing that I really wish we could go and take back, it's funny because I said delayed evaluation, or I guess uh, what Hadley calls it non-standard evaluation, yeah. uh, is something that, that I couldn't live without with R, but also, I wish it wasn't the default. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I wish you know the the you know Shiny's tens of thousands of lines of of code at this point, and I wish the six functions where I really needed that delayed evaluation, and I did, I could have opted into it instead of it being the default on every single function call that's ever made in R. Um, you know, aside from that, I think. It, I, it may be a failing of imagination of me as a developer. I'm really used to coming into a system and seeing what are the rules and what can I do within those mm -hmm. rules. Uh, someone like 
like JJ actually is a good partner for me because he tends to think, well, how can we change those rules, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, but for me, I tend to say, like, what really interesting and surprising and novel things can we do within this set of constraints? And uh, for better or for worse, I'm very used to the set, set of constraints that, that R gives us. So cool. uh, a lot of other people that I talk to in the R community, they'll complain about, oh, if only R core would do this or do that. And um, I, I tend not to even think about those things. I tend to think R is what it is, and yeah. it's great, and we're able to. Pretty fantastic. There are very few times, you know, uh, when we're when we're building out features in in the tools that we build, where we think, ah, if only R wasn't like this, yep. you know. I agree. So. I agree. Uh, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about? Um. No, I don't think so. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining great. me, Joe. Thank you.